Hello and welcome back to the Sci-Fi Primer. Today we'll conclude the story of Down Below Station by CJ Cherry. I've noticed over the last month that the listenership to the audio portion of this channel has surpassed the video views by a factor of four. With this in mind, though this will continue to be a video channel, I'll probably be providing more descriptive audio of what is happening for those listeners to reflect the primary audience there. And to everyone, video and audio, thank you all for following. If you'll remember from last time, some damaged Sol Corporation carrier ships were docking on Pell Station at Tau City for repairs after a battle with Union forces out at Viking Station around Epsilon Eridani. They had been ordered to stand down from the fight shortly after it began, and no one but the head commander knew why. Well, it turns out that there was a ceasefire settled between Sol Corporation and the Union. Recall that Sol Corporation is the Earth branch of Stellar Trade, and that Union is the faction of the Outer Worlds, away from Earth's reach. In the middle are the Merchanters, unaffiliated trade vessels that travel between the stations and stars of the two aforementioned superpowers. Pell Station was not enthusiastic to have a whole slew of military personnel on station, added to the already cramped stationers, merchanters, and refugees on board that I spoke about in the last episode. The refugees section of the ship, which was sealed off for quarantine, is referred to as Q for short. In the absence of a formal government or police force, a kind of mafia develops in Q to maintain order, but also to assume control of the black market. As the military vessels begin to assert their influence on station, they start to feel emboldened and impose martial law on the place. They start closing off sections of the station not under their control in order to establish control over the sections they do occupy. Then they expand to the next section, systematically taking over the place. The former administrators of the station are quickly losing their influence. You'll recall in the last installment that the former administrator of the Down Below station on the planet of Pell had been recalled back to the station in orbit. He was none too happy about this and set about to rally the refugees into a mob to riot on the station. He takes advantage of the chaos to murder the head of the Pell orbital station and take over. The now deceased head of the station had two adult sons, uh, one who is down below planet side and the other who goes into hiding on the station. Now the main sections are sealed off, but there are tunnels connecting the various sections of the ship. These are known to the Hiza, that's the name of the native primate-like population on the planet that I'd mentioned last time, some of whom are on the station to work with humans. For them, going to the up above station is akin to a religious experience in sharing the sky with the sun. The Hiza help the humans in hiding on the station by leading them through the tunnels, which they know extremely well. Meanwhile, the Earth Corporation fleet around Pell are dealing with Union ships baiting them at the periphery of their sensor range. Their heavy-handed tactics backfire when all the merchant ships around Pell um, leave the station. The merchanters have had their fill. Imagine in a chess game as the two sides are facing off and getting into skirmishes and then the pawns all leave the board. That's kind of what happens here. While this is happening on the orbiting station, down on the planetary station things are getting dire. The humans down below know that they are likely to be used as pawns either uh, by the earth forces currently occupying the orbital station or eventually by Union forces, should the Union gain a hold of the station. They can't breathe the planet's atmosphere, therefore they bring some breathable dome habitats to the forest with generators and supplies, being helped by the planet-bound Hiza. This turns out to be a temporary solution. The Earth military come down below to ensure that shipment of goods continues and resumes. They put the stationers to work 24-7 to keep operations running. It all comes to a head when the leader of the Earth Corporation fleet decides to massacre the stationers on the orbital station and those down below 
so as to leave nothing for a union to recoup should union get a hold of Pell. The stationers down below stage a revolt and manage to blow up a hole in the Earth Corporation ship that's planetside. Up above, in orbit, one of the captains decides to protect the stationers and goes rogue. This is Signe Mallory. She's captain of the carrier called Norway, which had brought refugees to Pell Station at the very beginning of the story that I mentioned in the previous episode. Uh, Norway flies around the planet of Pell to evade fire from all the other Earth carriers and flies over close enough to the enemy Union ships at the periphery to contact them and tell them that if they want to make a move, now is the time. The Earth fleet decides to turn tail and run, especially th since there uh, start to appear thousands of blips on their sensors. These are the merchanters coming back to reclaim Pell Station, but not just the merchanters that left Pell earlier. This is an alliance of all unaffiliated merchanters, numerous enough to balance out the two superpowers of Earth and Union. They move in and declare Pell's world to be neutral territory, protected by the alliance and by the former Earth ship Norway, which had broken rank. We are left with a sense of optimism that things have stabilized, massacres have been avoided, but also with foreboding that there is maybe a greater conflict waiting to happen between these now three superpowers, Earth, Union, and Alliance. And this is the genesis of the Union-Alliance universe. And that's it for this story. I hope it wasn't too hard to follow. It's very complex. I had to stop halfway into reading it because I was getting certain characters mixed up. So I made a list to keep the characters' names and allegiances straight. I'll put it on the screen for a few seconds so that you can snapshot it if you like. It might come in handy if you're reading the story for the first time. For the audio feed, I'll make it the thumbnail image for the episode. It's not entirely complete, but it covers characters that show up more than once and shows their allegiance. The novel Down Below Station had won the 1982 Science Fiction Hugo Award for Best Novel. It sets up the universe in which C.J. Cherry situates several other stories of hers. As I would mentioned in the previous episode, the introductory chapter provides a summary of human expansion from Earth into space, which is very similar to that in Elite Dangerous lore, from what I can tell. If you want to check for yourself, you can download the free sample of Down Below Station for Amazon Kindle, and I'm sure it's also available on EPUB readers. The sample includes the whole section on human expansion. Uh, see if you can find other similarities that I may not have noticed. Also, I learned that there is a song called Signe Mallory, written by obvious fans of the novel in honor of the captain of the Norway. I will link uh, to a recording of it in the show notes. And that is my show for today. I hope that you enjoyed it. And until next time, bye for now.